Hello, friends. Continuing with our discussion on leadership. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the traits of a toxic leader. We need to avoid being a toxic leader at all times. As we all know, all managers are not leaders. And all leaders are not great leaders. Now, what is a great leader? A great leader is one who can unite and create coherent teams. Every team member needs to be in sync. He needs now, by doing this, what really happens is that he is going to make sure that his organization becomes a powerhouse. Great teams lead to great performance and great performance makes your organization a powerhouse. So, a great leader has to be able to create unified and coherent teams and give those teams the, the necessary tools for them to perform outstandingly, which will then lead to your organization become a very, very powerful one. So great leaders, generally speaking, pay attention to three very important aspects. The first is communication. They communicate very well with the teams, with all the clarity, with all the tools that are required by giving them and communicating the tools that are, they require to perform. They collaborate, not only with the teams, not only with just all the stakeholders, but people outside who would be able to contribute to the success of their company. And at the end of the day, they get work done. If anybody cannot get work done, the whole point is lost. So they get work done. What are not so great leaders? Okay, as I said, all leaders are not great. So what are the traits of the not so great leaders? First thing is that they tend to create a negative impact on their team's as well as team members, as far as career is concerned, mental health is concerned, and psychologically well, psychological well-being is concerned. So th these are not the great leaders if they, if they can't keep their uh, teams happy and their careers growing and their mental health very sound. They are unsupportive of team members, and this is what leads to what we just talked about. They do not coach and train. More often than not, they leave the employees to fend for themselves. Or, as I know in a lot of cases, people think that spending money on training is a waste. I don't know. And, of course, one standard excuse I've heard over so many years is that if I, once I train them, they go away. And then the simple question, I'm sure all of you have heard it, is what if you don't train them? You are going to go away. So, they don't coach and train. And at the end of the day, they create not so great organizations and sometimes even tend to destroy the organizations that we are looking at. Okay. What are some of the harmful and toxic things a leader can do? And I'm going to just list, list them. They're not in any particular order, but they are all things that a good leader has to avoid to become a great leader. So some of the harmful and toxic traits of leaders, the first thing is not sharing feedback on time. More often than not, and I have seen this quite, quite often, is that they will give feedback to the employee only at the time of the review, whether it is six monthly, quarterly, annual, whatever. That means for that period of time when you have realized he's not performing well and there is a challenge, you're letting him perform under his capacity or in the wrong way but you will tell him only at the review. This untimely feedback leads to that person going on doing something wrong, okay? And 
what, what is the point? You are a leader. You are supposed to guide them 24-7. You can't wait for a review to give a feedback. Actually speaking, performance reviews are just meant to recap how that person has performed from the last review till that review and set goals and expectations for the next period and not to at that time give them feedback. No, it's not important. It's a recap. Your feedback has been given. If he has not followed the feedback, yes, tell him, pull him up and tell him that you boss, I told you all this, you've not been doing it. But don't give feedback when the review is there. The second thing that a lot of leaders do, and this leads to total lack of confidence among the team, is that they ask to be CC'd on every email that is sent. I don't know why. I mean, I can understand you doing this if a, you are training that recruit and you want to see he's being trained properly and he's doing the right thing. Or if it is somebody new who has joined the organization and you're still vetting him to check out what is his capability, capability and whether he is capable of communicating without your help or not. But all the time asking them to uh, give you a CC, keep you in the CC loop of every email just makes you an overbearing micromanager. And this does not lead to confidence or well-being of the employee. Okay. You not only destroy the confidence of the, the thing, but his motivation is also killed. And therefore, you don't have to do that. Another thing, leaders always love to show that they are busy. So they are routinely unavailable to the team members. I can understand that each leader also has his profile. He has his tasks and he has to worry about his career. I fully understand that. But once you are a leader, you need to balance your career, your time with that of the time you will spend with your team and help them in their careers. That's what you are. You are a leader. You're supposed to help your team. So don't be unavailable all the time. That's not good. Another thing, and this has specially started since COVID, is everybody all the times wants a video call. Why? There are Most of the things can be done by a voice call. Why do you want a video call? If it can be done by email, do it by email. If it needs a uh, talk, do a, uh, the thing, do a voice call. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes when it's really urgent, when you have to show something, when you have to share the screen or whatever, you have to share a document, you have both of you all need to look at simultaneously and discuss. I can understand you asking for a video call, but you can't make that person be constantly available and connected through a camera. And don't be a reluctant listener. Okay, that's, that's not going to help at all because you need to listen. And you need to listen to the challenges of the team member as well as what ideas he has. Maybe he may not be qualified in your eyes, but he comes up with a brilliant idea. Maybe you call it beginner's luck. I don't care. But listen to him. Listen to the ideas that he's presenting. Listen to the challenges. Guide him and make him solve those challenges. Help him to solve those challenges. Another this thing, a trait of uh, toxic leaders is that they indulge in unhealthy rivalries within team members as well as within teams. Most organizations will have more than one team. And maybe they are referring, uh, they are reporting to different leaders. But when you create an unhealthy rivalry, uh, rivalry is great because each team gets pushed to do better. But don't create an unhealthy rivalry. Because that kind of a rivalry leads to a lack of trust and a lack of transparency. Okay, what is going to happen that it erodes the cooperation between team members or between teams. And that leads to more of finger pointing. He did this, he did that, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. More importantly, it leads to hiding of information or not giving an honest viewpoint when one is really necessary and it can help the whole team, even if it's not the same project. Okay, so 
and all this put together, you lose the potential of being the powerhouse that your organization is capable of. Another uh, trait of a toxic leader is unfocused priorities. What happens is that when your priorities are not focused, when you are not clear about what, supposing you call a meeting and you give up a haphazard agenda and that too at the last minute, not giving the time uh, team time to prepare, okay? That agenda does not clarify the goal of the meeting and does not tell your team members who are going to attend the meeting what they should prepare and come, even if they, you give them the time. So make sure that your agendas are well-defined and that you are working properly. In a meeting, don't get into the nitty-gritty with the whole team. There has to be a goal for the meeting. Normally, that goal is to decide a plan of action. You don't detail into the plan of action. That you do only with the concerned team, not the whole team. Okay, And when you do get into such details, what happens is that a lot of questions, a lot of queries remain unanswered. And a lot of challenges that the team is facing, don't you don't give them decisions because you are so busy discussing the minute details. So you don't give them a proper decision and you don't give them an actionable decision for sure. If, a, if you give a decision, that decision should be something that they can act on. Another big, big challenge is delegation and then you abdicate. If you are delegating somebody something, delegate it right. Make sure that he understands what you are delegating. To make sure that he understands how to do that task that you are delegating to him. If he does not sit and explain to him, if necessary, train him, coach him. And even after all this, when he has started, whenever he needs your help, he might face some crucial situations. He might say, face some tricky situations. It may not be crucial, but he's not able to figure it out. It is your duty as a leader to help him to get over that and solve that challenge. So if you are delegating without proper follow-up, it can actually undermine and destroy the confidence and motivation of the team. Because they will feel that they're not able to do it properly because you have not guided them properly. And therefore, they think they're incapable. They lose confidence and they lose motivation also. And you have to remember that even after delegating, you are not doing the task. But the responsibility is still yours. You still need to get the task completed right, correctly, and on time. So you can't de delegate and then forget about it, abdicate. So you need to continuously monitor and make sure that the task is going properly. And then two important things you can do here. First is set intermediate milestones. So you know which stage of the project they are in. Okay. And the second thing is to make sure that you set up a reporting system where they report to you at regular intervals, telling you about this progress. But this monitoring cannot be excessive. You cannot just be on their case all the time because then you're becoming a micromanager. We've already discussed that it's no good. And even if you monitor too little, there is the harm that you will not be there when your team really needs you and they're facing a challenge, okay? So it's necessary that you find the right balance about how to monitor. And by setting up this intermediate milestones and the reporting system, I think a lot of those challenges are automatically taken care of. And because you are doing this, because you're monitoring, you are there when they need your help and you will be there to help them through the challenge, not by doing the task, but by coaching them, guiding them, training them, advising them, whatever is necessary to do the task, but let them do the task themselves. Okay. So another thing is a lot of times because of certain attitude of the leaders, they tend to create, they tend to create unreasonable and unnecessary conflict. 
okay, this unproductive conflict actually leads to backbiting. Okay, it leads to holding back honest opinions. It destroys team unity. It leads to un, an unreasonable and unnecessary conflict that leads to unproductive conflict. And it leads to backbiting. It leads to holding back honest opinions. It destroys team unity and potential. So you need to handle conflicts very effectively. And there are, there are two types of conflicts that come to mind. One is a relationship conflict. And this happens more often when there is failure facing or has faced the team. Because then what happens is finger pointing begins, the blame game begins, and that, that spoils relationships between team members. And the other is what is known as a task conflict. Now, as far as I can think, a task conflict, if handled well, if handled in a healthy way, is a most welcome kind of conflict. Because first of all, it tells you that when they are discussing a task and there is a conflict between one or two or four people, that means they are thinking about the issue, they are discussing the issue, which is a very positive sign. So I would say as a leader, encourage that. But as a leader, you also need to make sure that it does not go south and it does not spoil the uh, entire team's morale. Okay. Now, when you delegate, you have to make sure that you empower the team to take decisions. And you have to define who takes what decision and what level of decision and what kind of decisions they take independently and what kind of decisions they need to come back to you or inform you about. Don't involve yourself in every decision. You don't have the time or the energy for it. You have other work to do. Okay. Don't dictate solutions. You give them the goal. You give them the path. Let them figure out their solution. If necessary, let them run by run it by you before you this thing. But let them decide their own solution and let them uh, then follow that. You set the goal, the destination. Let them be the drivers. They know how to handle the traffic. They know how to uh, handle the speed bumps that come their way. Let them drive it. Okay, but yes, you set the destination. A lot of uh, leaders I know only look at the end result. While it is important to look at the end result because that's going to tell you whether you're successful or not, but look at the process. See if, how team members are performing. There may be some team member who is not performing as well as the other, although you win and you reach your goal. Those kind of people need help, need guidance, need coaching. So if you're looking at the process, you will be able to determine these people and you will be able to help them. Very often it is necessary to product, protect your team, okay? especially when things go wrong. It is great to protect. But sometimes that protection tends to go cross the line. okay? And then you start protecting them. You don't let them interact with certain people. You may not let them directly interact without your presence with your boss and all. That's not good. That's not protection. That is actually making them scared of what they are supposed to be actually having the courage to face. Okay? So don't protect them unnecessarily. Do not block them from getting necessary. Actually, talking to your boss might give them exposure to a larger view, which you may not have been able to convey to them. Okay, so make sure and avoid that my team, your team conflict at all times. Okay, whether it is within your two teams or whether it is between you and another leader's team, avoid that conflict. Okay, so these are the traits of uh, toxic leaders. Avoid them and that will itself put you on the path to great leadership. Next uh, talk is going to be on great leadership. I hope you enjoy this one, but the next one, make sure you listen to it because that's going to tell you how you move ahead. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. Reminding you again to like my pages and to like the video. Thank you. Bye-bye.